We have Jordan Berry with me here today. Jordan, I appreciate you giving me a moment. We're going to dive into something that I have a particular interest in. So this episode is going to be a bit selfish as I'm trying to understand this asset class. But Jordan has expertise around laundromat investing. And if you want more information, Jordan can help you with a free download regarding how to buy your first laundromat by going to laundromatresource.com slash REI Mastermind. So you don't even have to sign up for anything. Jordan is going to have a link there for you. So head up over to laundromatresource.com slash REI Mastermind for that. But really appreciate you giving me a moment here today, Jordan. Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm excited to chat laundromats. So exciting. We won't dive too deep into your backstory because I'm sure you've told that story a million times. But before we hit record, you mentioned a couple of things, and I think we're going to delve a little bit into it. Is first of all, how did you find your way to laundromat investing? For- uh, yeah, a random little story. I always am interested in how people get into this weird little business. But essentially, so I was a pastor for 15 years and had small kids and was ready to just take a break from doing that vocationally. Didn't really know what to do. Had a little bit of money. My thought was, hey, let's take our money. We can rent out our house. I live in Southern California. We can rent out our house here and go buy a condo in Hawaii on the beach somewhere and live there until the kids are school age and we can come back. And my wife thought, or we could buy a laundromat. And so (laughs) we bought a laundromat. And the idea behind it was to have some income coming in that isn't tied to your time necessarily. I wouldn't say that it's passive in the traditional sense of passive, but I don't know too many businesses that require less time for the kinds of returns you can get. Yeah. I mentioned to you that this kind of on my radar for a couple of reasons. First of all, I had recently read an article regarding some of the top businesses that fail Mm -hmm. and Restaurants are typically high on the list. Bar ownership is really high on the list. On the other side of things, one of the least failed is typically laundromats. So that's one of the reasons that it seemed to marry a couple of things, business ownership and real estate, since that's the name of this podcast is real estate investing. But you had you started off a little rocky. At first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was funny because you said that's what drew you to the industry. And I think that's what draws a lot of people to the industry. But my experience was a little different. I really had no connections. I did as much research as I could on the industry getting into it. But I really, I was relying on that broker to really help me figure out the business and figure out a good one to buy. And it just so happened that the broker I got connected up with just randomly online was not the best person to connect with and really just sold me a a pipe dream really. And so I went into buying my first laundromat expecting to make some money. And I ended up losing money for months and probably 18 months. I was losing 1500 to $2,000 a month in that laundromat and feeling there's a stat. I'm actually not even sure. I was just looking it up yesterday. Really. I'm not even sure where the stat comes from, but there's a stat out there that says, Hey, 95% of laundromats succeed. And I just, I remember being at that laundromat at night thinking, how in the world can I be failing at a business where 95% of people succeed? And it was just, it was not a great feeling. And it took me a really long time to dig my way out of that hole that I put myself in. That sounds like some pretty big lessons learned in that situation. What changed now that you've been acquiring additional laundromats? How do you find that laundromat? That's a good buy. Yeah. Expensive and painful lessons. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So really it's what you're looking at and what your expectations are. Right. And location obviously is key, similar to real estate, right? Location is key and maybe even more so with laundromats, like you can't really move a laundromat, all that infrastructure is in there. And so you got to have a good location. Lease is crucial. Uh, One of the biggest reasons that the laundromats that do fail is having a bad lease, one that's either too expensive or not long enough, or there's terms in there that basically can take your business away from you. Like I said, you can't move it. So if your lease gets canceled or it runs out and the landlord decides not to renew, then you're out of business. Looking through that and then going through a process of analyzing the deal and having clarity on what you're buying when you're buying it. And that really is the key. 
and that really is easier said than done, especially when you're buying your first one and you don't know a lot because it is a cash business by and large. There's more and more adding card payment systems and app payment systems, but the majority of laundromats still are coin, coin operated cash based systems. And so it can be really hard to pinpoint exactly how much money is coming into the business and exactly how much money is going out of the business. So there's tips and tricks that you need to know to really figure that out. You mentioned that it seems like technology is catching up with this industry a little bit. Have you found, it goes back to the location again, are you putting in more modern stuff depending on the neighborhood? Yeah, absolutely. This industry, it's kind of a joke in the industry. I laugh about it at least, but we've been basically no, almost no technological advances for decades until semi-recently when different payment systems started coming in. Just the first touchscreen washers and dryers just came out within the last couple of years. I've literally, I've literally gotten like P&Ls written, handwritten on a napkin, literally, not like a joke, but actually before. And new ways to collect and analyze and utilize data are coming in. So finally, we're starting to catch up, but we got a ways to go still. You mentioned location earlier. What type of locations are you typically looking for? And what's you would be something, especially somebody who's looking to do this for the first time, what should they be looking for regarding location? Yeah. And now things have changed since I bought my first one too. So now I think you need to back up before you think about location and you need to think about what business model you want to go to. So when people think of laundromats, people think of self-serve laundromats. They mm -hmm. think of maybe there's not even anybody working there. Maybe just somebody who comes and cleans up, but yeah, you know, or maybe somebody's there just helping customers and stuff. Uh, but there's a few different kind of business models now. So there's that self-serve laundromat, unattended, relatively passive, and then there's also the service side of the industry too that you can operate out of your laundromat. So you can have the self-serve plus a service side where you have a drop-off laundry service where, you know, customers bring their laundry to you and you do it for them. And now, and especially since COVID, but now pickup and delivery has really been booming. And I think really we've only scratched the surface there. I think pickup and delivery laundry will probably be, if not almost ubiquitous, I think it's going to be a lot, a lot more popular in, as we continue on just because laundry, nobody likes to do laundry. So if somebody comes and picks it up for you, washes it, folds it, brings it back to you, who doesn't want that, right? And so you need to determine your business model first. Are you looking just for self-serve? Are you trying to have a service side of your business? Because those are going to be different demographics of people. So if you're looking for self-serve side of things and you want to build that business, the locations that you're looking for, number one, you want to have good visibility from the street. You want to have good parking, those kinds of things. And then you want to be in neighborhoods where the kinds of people who want to do self-serve laundry or need to do self-serve laundry are going to do it. So typically that's going to be a renter population. So apartment buildings, rental housing, even, and then generally speaking, we're looking at below median income in terms of how much income is coming into a household. We're looking for below median income because that's typically the demographic we serve. And so those are some of the things that you want to be looking for. I mean, you're looking for a good self-serve laundry. And then on the flip side, on the service side, it's going to be above median income. It may be renters. It may not be renters, but I'd say probably the majority is not a renter um, in that scenario. So it's a higher income, maybe a dual income family or, or a younger 20 something in a white collar profession, those types of things. You mentioned uh, picking your business plan. Is one of those business plans partnering with somebody that has an apartment building and you're providing the, the vending, the machines or I'm running yeah. into a lot more and more, and at least in our part of the world, mixed use properties where there's a ton of apartments above and commercial on the main floor. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And there's different ways to do that too. Like you could have a, you could have a laundromat on a main floor of an apartment building or a lot of apartment buildings or multifamily housing have wash washers and dryers on premises. And so there are companies and people who have routes where they, they purchase and install and service the machines in those complexes and then go around and collect and share some of the profits with the, 
the landlord or the property owner. So you initially mentioned that first business you purchased, you were losing fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars per month. What steps did you take to turn that around, or did you sell it off? No, I did not. I probably should have sold it off, but I stuck with it. So yeah, so one of the things I realized is so when I bought the laundromat, it was a rundown. It's what we call a zombie mat, right? It was rundown. Half the lights were out. Half the machines were out. It was dirty. There was homeless people there all the time. That kind of thing. It's just not the kind of place a typical laundromat customer, which is usually a woman with kids, is going to want to come if they have another option. And one of the things I did was I came in, I put in mostly almost all new machines and rehab the place, new floors, paint, all that stuff. But one of the things I found was it was much more difficult to rehab the reputation of the laundromat than it was to rehab the actual laundromat itself. And so some of the things that I did were I just, I had to be doggedly adamant that it had to be a safe, clean place for customers. And then once, once I could provide the kind of experience that I think my typical customer would want to have when they go do their laundry, then it was about getting the word out, right? So it was about flyers, it was about running Google ads. It was, I'm, I made a mistake and ran Yelp ads. I don't recommend running Yelp ads, but Facebook ads, those kinds of things just to drive some traffic. And one of the things I didn't do that I would do now if I was in that scenario is to do a wow event, some sort of like mm. opening ceremony, like op grand opening or some kind of giveaway or party or something just to get people over there to see, oh, hey, look, this is not the same dark, dingy laundromat that, you know, that it used to be. This is clean. The owner's keeping the people who shouldn't be there out so that the people who should be there can be feel feel comfortable in there and see that. And I didn't do that. And I think that would have helped early on to give me a, a little bit more of a jump start. And with that particular project, you mentioned that you relied a little bit too heavily on the broker. Did they provide you a pro forma or something that kind of painted the rosy picture? Yeah. Yeah. It was a pie in the sky pro forma. And I do a lot of consulting calls now with people looking to buy laundry because there's still not a lot of resources out there. There's more in some bigger names now who are touting laundromats as being a good investment, which they are, and a good business, which they are, but are a little lighter on the practical, hey, how do I not get fleeced when I buy my first laundromat? <laughs> and so I do a lot of consulting calls with people and we go through all deals. We'll go through and I'll just say, hey, look, Here's a more realistic picture of what this laundromat actually is like. And yeah, the numbers the broker gave me, I now know are, we're never, ever going to be realistic numbers, but I didn't know that at the time. It's interesting. You brought up that you have to select your business model. Like this is how naive I am. I just, the concept of you buy a laundromat and people just show up. That was the, that was the business model. <laughs> That's what I, yeah. I, guess I was very naive on that part. And it's true. That is true to an extent. And it's becoming, it's becoming a, and it depends on where you are partially too. I'm in LA and the LA market, it's probably the biggest laundromat market. Maybe New York is there too, but it's becoming more competitive. And our industry has never advertised like by and large, like we've never done any advertising. We've never done any of that stuff, but more and more owners are finding Actually, we need to take care of our customers a little more and we need to let people know what we have to offer. And so that's why I think in our industry, a lot of the image of what people think of when they think of a laundromat is it's not a good image, right? Our industry does not have a great image because so many owners for so long, it was a badge of honor. Hey, I've had my machine for 30 years or 40 years. Yeah, but the experience hasn't been all that great for your customers in all that time because for 20 years, your machines have been breaking down and it's playing a slot machine when you go do the laundry. I'm going to put my quarters in and hopefully uh, the machine will work and my clothes will end up clean, but it just hasn't been a great experience. To your point, it, there's a little bit of a, if you build it, they will come because customers are going to come to the most convenient laundromat, barring anything else, right? Whatever's closest to them, as long as they can stomach the conditions there or the experience there, they're probably going to go to that one because it's going to be the most convenient. Where you want to try to 
expand your business a little bit is maybe there's another one where there's a gray area and they could choose which one they go to, or they're slightly in the other convenient area for another laundromat, but your experience is so much better that they're going to come to yours. And there's a lot of money to be made in laundromats right now in that gray area and slightly on the other side of the gray area into other laundromat territories if they're not taking care of their customers. So those are opportunities, I would say. So what type other ways are you taking care of your customers that attract people? Surprisingly, the main thing you need to do is just take care of the basics, right? Keep the place clean. Have If somebody's going to be there, like an attendant or something, just make sure they're friendly and they're helping people. Keep the place clean and keep the machines working. If you have coin changers, make sure those are full because if people come and there's no coins, they can't do their laundry and they leave and they go to another one and then they don't come back. So if you take care of the basics, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Make sure everything's working. Make sure everything's clean. You know, make sure people are happy and you're golden, right? Make sure the people who should be there feel comfortable there and the people who shouldn't be there don't feel comfortable there. And those are the basics. If you do that, you're going to be in great shape. Now you can enhance that experience by adding things like if you have a, a card or an app payment system, you can incentivize loyalty by offering buy 10 washes, get one free or or different types of promotions, those kinds of things. Paying attention to the atmosphere of your laundromat can be important too. So what do you have on the TVs? Is it news and depressing and infomercials and that kind of stuff? Or do you have something that's a little bit more uplifting, a little more positive, or are you playing music? Those types of things that you can be paying attention to just to Make sure customers have a good experience. All they need to do is have positive feelings when they come to your laundromat. And then they're going to keep coming to your laundromat. Sure. That kind of makes a lot of sense, especially you mentioned earlier that you're talking, you're dealing with typically moms and kids. So you mm-hmm. probably want an environment that provides a, a little distraction, at least for the kids while mom is doing some things. Yeah. And that, that's where if you can get into your typical customer's shoes and you think about the mom who's trying to load up the washing machine and the kids are riding around in the laundry carts and climbing on the folding tables. And mm-hmm. if you can help that mom have an easier experience, I know for a fact, a mom will drive a long way to go to a laundromat that is thinking through that for her, that will help her. Like I know if I take my kids to the closest laundromat, they're going to be running around everywhere, bored out of their minds, fighting, complaining, whatever. If I go to this other one down the road a little more, they've got whatever, they've got an iPad station or they've got a play place or they've got books or they've got something I know my kids can watch on TV, those types of things. Yeah. Having a subscription to Disney plus. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. This makes a lot of sense. So just to remind everybody, head over to laundromatresource.com slash REI Mastermind and take advantage of what Jordan has offered there regarding that free download. I'd be curious about, you coach people on this now, and you have a lot of students, I'm sure, regarding this. Have you found anybody some success in rural areas and small communities? Yeah, for sure. And it is a different, a little bit different ball game there, right? As as opposed to an urban area in LA, New York, or Chicago, or Dallas, those kinds of things are a little bit different than the rural areas. Typically, they're going to be a little bit smaller laundromats. People tend to be a little bit more spread out there. So there's going to be fewer competitors around, but also fewer people. So yeah, the, the interesting thing about the rural uh, areas is that I had a guy on my podcast, on the Laundromat Resource Podcast, that he was just eating up these small laundromats in these rural areas. And he had 10 or 12 of them or has, I think he has more than that now, but he was just eating them up and none of them were doing crazy numbers. If you get 10, 12 laundromats that are making three to $5,000 a month net each, and you get them for hundred, $150,000, that adds up real quick there. And yeah, you can definitely do well in the rural areas as well. So what's been the biggest surprise regarding this that you've run across so far? Regarding laundromats? The yeah, biggest like something, oh. so, something that uh, you didn't expect that made a big difference. Yeah, that's a good question. 
something surprising that I didn't expect that made a big difference in in the laundromats. I think on the negative side, I was surprised at how little technology we had in the industry. And so I think adding technology has just been a big boost in our industry. And I think one of the ripple effects of that is that you can now manage more laundromats than you used to be able to do because instead of going and going to 10, 12 stores and trying to collect all these quarters and all that stuff, all this stuff is happening digitally now and automatically. Mm -hmm. And so now management of bigger stores, management of more stores is becoming more and more feasible. And I think actually one of the biggest surprises over the last couple of years has been the peak in interest in laundromats. And I think it's only going to grow here. We've talked about the technology a couple of times. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the machines themselves. You make a very valid point. One of the reasons that it, this interests me as well is that we've had a couple properties where we've had we have the same Speed Queen coin operated machines from the 70s and they still are running. Yeah. Like how often should somebody prepare to change and service these machines? Yeah, the, that is a debated topic. And I think the perspective on this is shifting a lot. I can tell you which camp I fall in, but I, I there, so like I said, there is a camp of people who are like, Hey, badge of honor. I've had them for 30, 40 years, kept them running. There's still that pea green color or that off white color, whatever that they used to be. And it's a badge of honor. And you know, that that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but I think there's a new wave of, and I want to say this is probably biased and this is not meant to be an insult to anybody, but a little bit more savvy business owner investor that is coming into our industry who are recognizing, hey, if I keep my machines that long, my repair costs go up, I lose efficiency in the machine. So my utility costs are going up and utilities are one of your main costs, right? And, and I lose customers when they don't know if the machines are going to work. They're going to go somewhere where they feel like the machines are going to work. So I'm losing out on revenue by not replacing them. So there's a, the camp I would probably fall in is probably at around that 15 year ish mark. You should start thinking about replacing machines. Now, can they last longer than that? Absolutely. And if you asked like a manufacturer, they'll probably say 20 to 25 years. I just think at that 15 year mark, you still have a little value left in it. So if you want to sell it to somebody who wants some used equipment, you can do that and get some, recoup some of your value. But then when you replace it with the new equipment, you get some benefits from that, like increased efficiency. So your utility costs are going to go down. You can typically, when you replace your machines, you can raise the prices because people like shiny new things and you can just charge better and they're going to get a better wash anyways. Right. And so your margins go up from that too. And because people like shiny new things, you're probably going to attract some new customers. And so your revenue can and tends to go up when you replace machines at around that 15 ish year mark, give or take a couple of years. What does the depreciation schedule look like on that? Changing. I know that this year, or I guess last year, 2020. Now I'm all confused. So when I filed my 2021 taxes, there was still a bonus depreciation. I want to say, I don't remember off the top of my head, so don't quote me on this, but I want to say it's 10 or 12 years. And there so was you're a basically writing time. it out for the depreciation schedule. And that yeah. that's probably a good indicator. Maybe you should put in some different machines. Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's yeah. one of the benefits of laundromats too, right? Is that they're relatively low and it's not talked about that much but they're relatively low maintenance they're pretty high cash flow but they're also asset heavy and so that depreciation while it's not quite as good as real estate uh it's still it's pretty good and when you pair it with real estate even better are there any other outside of the machines i would imagine that you're also making money selling detergent and a few other things is there is that a pretty significant line item on you when it comes to the profits there yeah, it can be. I, I kind of joke sometimes that laundromats are the ultimate side hustle because they're you can run them on the side. Plenty of people have full-time jobs and run them, but they also mm -hmm. have side hustles within the side hustles. You can have ATM machines, you can sell soaps and detergents, you can have vending machines, you can there's 
sell purified water. There's a ton of different ways that you can make revenue from a laundromat. So yeah, absolutely. Now, granted, the primary income stream is and should be the, the washers and dryers, right? And so I wouldn't say, hey, if you had to choose between a washer and dryer and an ATM machine or a vending machine, I think you should probably, uh, yeah, I mean, it depends, but you should probably default to adding washers and dryers because that's going to be your primary income. However, most laundromats have other income streams also. So yeah, mm -hmm. there's lots of opportunity for that. So when you acquire a laundromat, and it's typically going to be some, there's going to be some distressed property there. You whether you're, do you find it best to replace as many machines as you can, or the problematic ones, or a slow roll? How do you just define all that? It probably yeah. is depends, right? <laughs> yeah, it's the answer to that is the answer to every question, which is it depends. And that, and not only that, but there's different opinions on it. There's different camps on it. So some people love to replace machines with new machines. And some people would love to replace new machines with used machines. And some people prefer to do them all at once. And some people prefer to slow roll it. I will say that the pluses of slow rolling is that you spread out how much capital you have to spend because the machines aren't cheap. And so you spread it out that way. And so the, it becomes a little more affordable to buy one, two, five machines than it does to buy 30 or 40 machines all at once the the argument on the other side is to just replace them all is you do get that wow factor and you do get a bump from rep replacing them all nobody's really gonna bat an eye nobody's gonna change laundromats i guess if you swap out five machines the current mm -hmm. customers might be happy with it and they might be excited about it and it might reinforce for them to stay maybe but if you replace all your machines, you will get people changing and coming to your laundromat. Now, the downside, obviously, is that there's a lot of cost to replace all the machines all at once. But there are a lot of financing options, even 100% financing options on equipment. So you, got, you have options, but it does depend. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you about financing. Mm -hmm. Is it very similar to just a standard real estate investing? You already mentioned I'm guessing that there's promotions and financing, whether through your appliance dealer, is that? So, yeah, so the manufacturers do have financing. Um, and then there's also some independent laundromat specific lenders uh, out there also. So, yeah, so for equipment financing, it really depends on the situation. You can get 100% financing on equipment sometimes, and sometimes they require a down payment. I will say that, the financing options for real estate are typically better in terms of traditional financing. So where you could buy a property for 20 or 25% down for real estate, you're probably looking at 30 to 35% down for a laundromat from a traditional mm -hmm. route. But there are SBA options too, where you put down less. However, only certain laundromats are going to qualify for SBA. So that's downside of SBA with a laundromat specifically. And again, because they're cash businesses and you know those SBA loans, they really like to know how the business is really doing and if it can really support that loan. And it can be difficult to pinpoint that in a lot of laundromats where there's not very accurate books or they don't have any books or they're intentionally misleading books, which happens sometimes. But I also will say because of that, it gets talked about in real estate circles a lot, the holy grail of seller financing, right? Like everybody's looking for seller financing deals. Mm -hmm. They're actually fairly common in the laundromat industry. And a big part of the reason why is because a lot of laundromats can't get traditional financing because they don't have books or because they've been cooking their books and so nobody will finance them. So that is, I guess that's one upside to laundromats and financing. And that probably explains why they require typically a larger down payment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Just the higher risk there. Okay. So you, I'd like to hear from you too. Now that you're going through the process, you're trying to find your first laundromat. What are some of those obvious red flags that somebody should be aware of? Yeah. So when I go through like a, a P and L or a pro forma or something like that with a client, we're looking for a few things. Number one, we're looking for just any kind of weird anomaly. 
right? Any number that just doesn't seem to fit with the story of this laundromat. And the I always say there's four pillars of due diligence for laundromats, right? We need to determine the income, how much money's coming in, determine the expenses, how much money's going out. And then the big one that I think a lot of people miss that can really cost you, but it's where a lot of the anomalies are going to pop up is determine the trajectory of the laundromat. Is business going up, down, is it flat and why? And then the fourth one is look for value add opportunities, ways to improve the business. What we're looking for is something like uh, the, they say the income is going up, but we look at the water bill and the water bill is flat or it's been going down. That's weird because you'd expect if income was going up, the water bill would also go up because you're using more water and probably the water company has not reduced prices because they don't <laughs> tend to do that very often, if ever. <laughs> We're looking for anomalies like that. Some of the, I wouldn't call them necessarily red flags, but some of the yellow flags that you're looking for are round numbers, which mm. you're going to get a lot of round numbers. And the way that it works, just to give you an overview, the way that it works is usually you're not, you're going to get very general round average numbers from the owner. And you're going to have to make your offer based on that information. And then you just might want to make sure you have good contingencies in place so that when you go in and find out a more accurate story of what the numbers actually look like, that you have some wiggle room to either renegotiate or pull out of that deal if you need to pull out of the deal. So yeah, so we're looking for like round numbers. We're looking for in income that just doesn't seem to fit with the laundromat. And it's hard to know what that means exactly until you've looked at a lot of deals. So you can go through and look through a lot of deals. You can shortcut that process and talk to somebody who's done it. Where I see a lot of people go wrong is actually on the expense side. And it's not that people falsify expenses because those are harder to falsify. You can verify the expenses easier than you can verify the income, but it's that expenses get left out. And for example, I had clients who we were buying a laundromat and it was not intentional. It was actually unintentional. It was unfortunate, but it turned out that there was a sewer bill that the seller didn't know about. It was going to the landlord and the landlord never passed it over, but it was $700 a month. And so our offer dropped dramatically based on that information. Unfortunately for the seller who got hit with a huge sewer bill and a decrease in the equity in their business. So that was an unfortunate situation. But for my clients, it literally would have cost them probably $75,000 in equity from day one if we had gone through with that original purchase price with that extra bill. So missing even a $500 a month expense can be a big deal. Sure. So with all of that being said, I'd be curious as to what is your I'm sure this is going to be, it depends on the buyer as well, but what type of returns are you trying to achieve through laundromats? Yeah. So an average unleveraged return on your money for a laundromat is usually around 20 to 25%. 20 is, and, and the way that laundromats are valued is similar to how a commercial real estate is valued. So commercial real estate uses a cap rate. Laundromats use a multiple, which is just the inverse of the cap rate, maybe because we're less sophisticated. I don't know. We like to multiply rather than divide a percentage. But so we do a multiple. So a typical, mul a typical multiple that you apply to the net income of the laundromat to determine the value is three and a half to five ish. And we're seeing a little bit of float right now where those multiples are kind of coming up because there's increasing demand. And for various reasons, there's not as much supply on the market right now. And so they're creeping up a little bit, but three and a half to five is an average and a five times multiple laundromat. It's going to be a, probably a decent sized laundromat that has relatively new equipment that has stable cash flow. And it's just, it's not going to be super risky, but because of that, you're going to pay, you know, quote unquote, a premium for it. But at a five times multiple, that's still a 20% return on your money. So it's still not bad for, for a good investment there. Right. Do you run into any situations that people need to be aware of regarding like city ordinances or that type of thing? I'm sure some people are thinking like, where can I put a new laundromat versus mm -hmm. acquiring an old? 
Yeah, yeah. One thing you need to get clarity on, if you're thinking about building a store from scratch or putting it into a space that, that didn't previously have a laundromat or doesn't currently have a laundromat, one thing you need to look out for is, or find out probably in the early stages of that planning is something called impact fees. I mean, they can be called various things, but impact fees, I think is the most common. And there's a lot of ridiculous fees out there from the government, right? Impact fees have got to be close to the top. So basically what an impact fee is like a, Hey, an A-OK, or you got it. It's just a thumbs up to say, yes, you can connect to the sewer line. And these impact, it's not a permit to do it. It's not, you know, it's not the actual construction of it. It's just like an A-OK. And these impact fees can vary wildly. Some places don't have them at all. Some places it's a fairly nominal amount, like $100 a machine or something like that. Here in California, I was looking to build one with a couple partners, 3,500 square foot space, never been a laundromat before. And we started down the road and then we looked into the, the impact fees for it. And the impact fees alone were going to be $390,000. So that's without actually breaking ground. That's without any materials, any construction, no machines, no permits, none of that stuff. It's just the AOK, $390,000. And that killed that deal right away. And I don't say that to scare people because I think that was pretty uncommon. Even we didn't expect that, but it is something to factor in and something that a lot of people don't know to look for early on, but it can kill a deal. So if you could go back into time and give your younger laundromat investor one piece of advice, what would that be? Yeah, I think so. So when I bought my laundromat, my fixer upper zombie mat, I paid all cash for it and then retooled it with 100% financing on the back end. Nothing wrong with that at all. And I wouldn't be afraid to do that anymore. But one of the things I found, which seems a little counterintuitive at first, is the cheaper the laundromat is, and cheap is relative, but the cheaper the laundromat is, actually the more risky that laundromat tends to be. And there's a cutoff that I put somewhere around $100,000 to $150,000. Anything below that, you basically need to assume it's really not making much money or maybe not any money at all. And it's a fixer upper. It's something you're going to come have to do a value add to and fix it up and improve and increase the business. And so a lot of people are looking to get in at that price point, which again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it is a, on the riskier side of things. I would say probably, even though laundromats don't fail very often, probably the vast majority of the ones that do are in that price range, most likely. And so I actually would probably advise myself to, hey, use that money instead of buying all cash. Use that money as a down payment for one that's a little bit more stable, that has a little bit more margin there. That you can get a little bit more information about if that's possible. So, you know, it's the whole sweat equity versus equity, equity, money equity, right? They're inversely related there. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do and you can only get your foot in the door by getting fixer upper laundromat. And so you do what you got to do. If that's the route you want to go, the laundromat route, that's the route you want to go. Same with real estate, right? But for me, if, it, if I was to go back and do it again, I would tell myself, hey, use that money as a down payment for a little bit better performing laundromat. You mentioned when we first started this, that you're seeing quite a few people with more and more interest regarding acquiring laundromats. What are some of the misconceptions that they've, they're carrying when they come into this that you have to correct them on? Yeah. The kind of the big draw, right. Of laundromats is that they're passive, right? You come in, you collect corn quarters once or twice a week, and that's all you have to do. And that was the case for a long time. It's still the case in a lot of places now, but that is changing. And I will say that I don't believe laundromats are, I did when I got into it and that was part of my problem, but I don't believe anymore that laundromats are passive, but I also, I do believe that there aren't too many businesses out there where you can get the kind of returns or the kind of cash flow that you can get with laundromats with as little work as laundromats. So that's one correction. If somebody's coming in and they just want to have a passive business, you're dealing with a lot of people, right? A lot of people come through laundromats every single day, every single week. 
and you have a lot of machines, right? And so whenever you have people and you have machines, you're going to have problems and you're going to have to deal with those problems. And even if you hire like a manager to deal with those problems, you're going to have to manage that manager and they can become more and more passive as you scale, actually, if you scale the right way. But that I think by and by, by far, that's the number one way that people come in with a misconception is that they're just going to have to come in and collect quarters once or twice a week. Outside of hiring somebody, you mentioned with the people and the machines, there's going to be problems. How have you been handling some of those things remotely if you don't have somebody there? It depends on how your store is set up, right? Some of the issues can be resolved remotely through some of the new technology that's out there. And like you can remote start machines like from your phone at home, camera systems where you can communicate back and forth with somebody, even like the Cash App or Venmo or something like that. If you need to issue a refund instead of having to hop in the car and driving or sure. whatever. Um, so utilizing technology and automation can really help that you're going to have problems sometimes. <laughs> like I've, my laundromats have flooded where I've had two, three inches of water on the floor and I just had to deal with that. And really, if you're trying to be truly remote, you got to have somebody that you trust on the ground that can help you handle the issues. And, and kind of what I tell people who are interested in running a laundromat remotely is look, you just want to make sure you don't want to leave your business in the hands of a minimum wage employee, right? They're just not mm -hmm. going to care. Even if they're the best person, they're just not either not going to have the skill set or they're, it's not worth it to them to care the same way like a manager would, and definitely not the same way that you would as the owner. Well, John, Jordan, this has been a great conversation. And you, I told you, I warned you, I was going to ping pong all over the place <laughs> on this as I try to understand a few things. I want to remind everybody one more time, go to laundromatresource.com slash REI Mastermind. Jordan has that download there for you. But this is a prime example. Jordan, one of the taglines on this show is that you can either put in 10,000 hours or you can find somebody who has done that and mm -hmm. learn from them. This is a prime example of that. I can't stress enough regarding mentorship and some of the resources that you provide is that it's a very small price to pay based on some of the pricing I saw on your website mm -hmm. to get access to the expertise that you offer. I just want to point everybody to your site again, laundromatresource.com slash REI mastermind. Really appreciate your time, Jordan. I hope you won't mind me bugging you again sometime in the near future as we dive a little bit into some more of this. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me on and you ping me anytime. And uh, man, super excited to be a part of your network now and uh, feel free to connect me up with anybody who's got laundromat questions and uh, I'll be probably pinging you to connect up with some other investors also to learn the real estate stuff. Anytime. Happy to help and make those connections. So thank you again, Jordan. I hope to talk again sometime really soon. All right. Appreciate it.